Right, Aubrey. I know you know Technology Now super well. Can you cast your mind back to Technology Now episode number 90? Sort of go through your... My index. Your, <laughs> your index. You know it well, right? Um, well, by number, no, but I'm sure that it was wonderful. That was our episode that we did about non-stop computing. Mm. We finished the interview with this. They should care because I think these days the public governments have a high expectation for uptime. Yeah. All we need to look at is in the last 6, 12 months, some of the really visible major IT outages that have brought down industries. And I think that they need to care about uptime to protect their brand reputation and to keep their commitments to their end customers. I think the saying goes, there's no time for downtime, right? So that's the world we live in. And I guess we're heading back to nonstop this episode, right? Oh, we absolutely are. And we've even got Casey back to tell us more. I'm Michael Bird. I'm Aubrey Lovell. And welcome to Technology Now from HPE. I don't know about you, but in my day-to-day life, I don't really think about IT systems going down. That is, unless it affects me. You know, I think if everything's running properly, it's really easy to forget how devastating an outage can be. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I feel like we've talked about this before, right? When something crazy happens. And I'm pretty sure there was like a massive global outage last year, right? That we talked about where suddenly people couldn't pay for things using, you know, like our cards. And I think over a thousand flights were canceled. I mean, big things happen and it has big impacts. Yeah, we talked about that on a few episodes back, didn't we? This outage that we're talking about was indeed global. According to CNN, the insurers estimating the damage the outage caused have said that it cost Fortune 500 companies over $5 billion. And a report from a cyberist company Cover estimated that the outage could have caused the UK economy to fall by over $2 billion. And we have, of course, linked these figures in the show notes. You had it on your laptop, didn't you? I didn't have it on mine, but you had it on yours. Yeah, absolutely. We couldn't work. When you think about these things happening, it's like almost like a cyber hurricane coming in and just just absolutely destroying (laughs) all of your processes and technology that it's just not functioning, right? So it it is pretty critical that we fix these things. Yeah, it wasn't malicious or anything. It was just a simple mistake. But even a mistake can be incredibly costly. So later in the episode, I'll be talking to Casey Taylor. She's the vice president and general manager of HPE Nonstop. And we're going to be talking about the importance of fault tolerance in preventing unexpected downtime. But, Aubrey, you have something insightful, always fascinating to talk about first. Oh, you know I do. And you know what time it is, uh, because we are going to space in technology then. Okay, so... It's 1977, and the human race are about to begin a mission to space, which is still going on today. Michael, you're really good with this. Can you think what this might be? Yes, yes, yes. These are the Voyager missions, the two probes that are still going to this day. You win a prize. Oh, I love the Voyager missions. I love hearing updates. So yeah, tell me more, tell me more, tell me more. You are right. The Voyager missions. These two spacecrafts were sent out into space to explore the distant solar system and have become the first human made objects to enter interstellar space. Oh, I just think that is so cool. It is pretty cool, right? But this week, we don't care about them being in space or the scientific data they're collecting. What we're interested in are the computers on board and more importantly, how they prevent faults which could make them fail because when your computer is well over 15 billion miles away, that's very long, and a command from you takes over 23 hours to reach it, solving any problems which arise becomes much more complicated. Talk about long distance relationships. (laughs) I know, I know. And we were speaking recently on how that even works in space. So it's pretty crazy that we even have communication that can go that far. But anyways, how do you avoid having to solve problems? Well, it's simple. You don't allow them to occur in the first place. And I'm secretly laughing because if life were only that easy. The computers had to be able to not only self-diagnose any issues, but also self-repair them too before the damage became an actual issue. So the spacecraft use a technique called block redundancy for fault tolerance. Onboard Voyagers 1 and 2 are multiple redundant computers just waiting to be woken up and set to work if anything goes wrong with the main system. 
so sci-fi. The list of errors is obviously far too long to read out. However, there is one I want to mention, which is part of the command and control subsystem. And Michael, you're going to geek out about this. So every two seconds, it looks out for a message, which basically translates to I'm healthy as it constantly checks in on every other system before any messages are sent to make sure everything is working properly. I think it's one of the coolest achievements that we've done as humans. I think the fact that it's running technology from the 70s and still going, I think is a testament to how well built they are. And I guess like the fault tolerance they have in the system. You're right. You know, especially when we talk about fault tolerance too, right? In modern computers, it's going to be a bit different to something that was almost built 50 years ago, right? We would assume oh, that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, totally. And the requirements are completely different. Our networks are so much more complicated. And there is the conversation around always on 100% uptime. So to find out what always on 100% uptime computing is used for today, I spoke to Casey Taylor. She's the vice president and general manager of HPE Nonstop. Now, we've already done an episode about HPE Nonstop, which we will link to in the show notes. But for those of you who haven't had a chance to listen to that yet, I started off by asking Casey just to explain again exactly what Nonstop is and what it actually means. Nonstop ultimately is a platform for customers who are looking for extreme fault tolerance. And what it does really well is high volume transaction processing with a built in database and this kind of secret source of software that allows our customers to have uninterrupted mission critical platform for their most mission critical applications, right? So we think about this as a mission critical platform with software and hardware that delivers ultimate uptime. And it has unlimited scalability, which means that they can add on additional nodes, uh, you know, up to about 4,000 nodes. And that really gives our biggest customers that are looking at the most performance, you know, out of their mission critical workloads, you know, a lot of flexibility and scale. With a lot of fault tolerance? Yes. So it's hugely fault tolerant. And technically what we say is it's IDC level four in terms of fault tolerance. Uh, and we talk about five nines of availability. And really what five nines of availability means is it's 99.999% of the time up. And that equates to about five minutes in a calendar year of downtime. But the reality is for nonstop is that we're actually even better than that. We just don't promise that, right? You know, we have had customers, including a major auto manufacturer, for example, who's been running our platform for more than 35 years and they have not had any unplanned downtime in that 35 plus years. So, you know, it actually it really is fault tolerant. And of course, there are always issues that can arise outside of our own platform, you know, natural disasters, etc. But basically, it's nonstop and it does what it says on the tin. How do you make a system that never goes down? What's the differentiator between a standard rack server that you can just buy off the shelf? Well, the really cool thing is that this is our owned IP in HPE. And it goes back to 50 years ago when a company called Tandem was incorporated and they came up with this kind of visionary architecture design. And it started out as being really in the hardware itself. They had physical pairs of nodes that were working in Tandem. That's why the company was called Tandem. And so it would make sure that rather than failing over to something if something went wrong, it was already doing it twice and therefore it could immediately move that transition transaction forward, regardless of, you know, a component's outage. So that original architecture is is really what started it all and made it different from the way that we architect other systems. But then over the time, we have innovated. And, and what we've really done is we've abstracted that fault tolerance away from the hardware and actually into the software. So it's sort of software defined fault tolerance. Exactly. <laughs> So I've seen the term self-healing architecture used in reference to non-stop computing. How does that work? So it's interesting. Really what this system is designed to do is constantly look for anomalies, errors and issues. And you can think of it maybe a little bit like the body's immune system, whereby if we're going to get sick, our, our immune system is looking for any issues or anomalies in our body. And what it's designed to do, if it's running properly, is to intercept that and heal it before we actually get sick. And that's exactly what the system is supposed to do. So it's going to look and see when there is an issue happening within the platform, and it is going to correct it. And in the meantime, it's going to use the other non-impacted node to run the transactions while it heals itself on the other side. And does it use AI? We think about AI with nonstop as kind of AI adjacent. So at the moment, we are not planning to add a GPU or a DPU into our nonstop platform. 
which obviously are the processing units that give AI capabilities, right? But we do see a place for AI with nonstop. And what we see that, you know, as a really good match is because nonstop ultimately is the source of a lot of companies' mission critical data. And what does AI need? It needs data, right? It needs a great data set without errors. And so we are partnering with some really innovative companies to create solutions that work in unison with the nonstop platform, but don't necessarily put the analytics of running that AI on the platform, right? We would in real time intercept a transaction, for example, and pull that out off the nonstop and run the analytics on an adjacent machine and then go straight back into the nonstop real time. And fraud detection is a really great example of this. During a transaction, an adjacent machine working with the nonstop will be able to spot a fraudulent transaction in real time. And it's using AI to do that, but we're not running the AI workload on the nonstop machine because ultimately our customers really want to make sure that we guarantee that transaction. That's kind of the foundational idea of nonstop. And so we have to remain focused on what's important for our customers while introducing AI in a safe way. Where do we go from here? Like, I assume you haven't worked out a physics-defying way of having more than 100% uptime. Correct. I don't think there's anything greater than 100%. (laughs) There are ways that we can continue to be better. We have to stay true to our roots of fault tolerance. And that will always be our guiding kind of North Star because it's our differentiator. But we have to look for ways to innovate, to bring a better experience to our customers, to ensure that the nonstop systems are I say playing nice with other enterprise tooling, right? And that we are modernizing the nonstop platform in a hybrid cloud environment while remaining true to those core foundational aspects of availability, scalability, and security. So why is nonstop computing not built into the fabric of standard servers? Wouldn't it make sense for everyone to use a system which never goes down? Is it it like a cost thing? Is it like just the practicality of it? Cost is definitely part of it, for sure. And, you know, nonstop, part of its secret source is its own operating system. And so it's a good and bad thing, right? I mean, ultimately, the operating system, the nonstop OS, it's Linux-like, but it is not Linux. And so it requires some special management, I would say. It's actually really easy to run by itself. So the number of administrators that you need and operators to run a nonstop system versus your standard Linux x86 environment is very few in comparison which is great in terms of a total cost of ownership view, right? We keep that down because it kind of runs itself. It is different and there is a cost involved, right? Everything costs. And if you want ultimate uptime and availability, then you're paying for that value through the software that we offer. And I think that that's why, you know, a good enough alternative is out there. There are high availability systems that are not fault tolerant, right? That's, I guess that's the difference. High availability, you could think about as in, you know, trying to minimize downtime. Fault tolerant is preventing downtime at all. And I suppose there are some particular workloads where you absolutely cannot have downtime financial transactions on a ledger to some extent. Exactly. So that's why we have around 70% of our customer base are in the financial services industry. And it is incredibly important. And sometimes for sovereign nations, right, uh, we are the backbone of their banking infrastructure. So yes, absolutely. Any outage or any downtime can be devastating, right? These days, we rely so heavily on being able to transact, you know, from our phones, uh, you know, online uh, or at an ATM. And so those things are absolutely mission critical. And that's why nonstop is a really sweet spot. What sort of numbers are we talking about? Like how many of the world's financial transactions go through nonstop? Do you know? Well, you know, we have to be careful about what we can say, but I would say six out of the top 10 corporate banks in the world run their corporate banking system on nonstop. In the US, around 90% of credit card transactions run through a nonstop system. Wow. Some of the major rental car companies use nonstop for their reservation system as well as the transactions and payments. And so you can see that in any given day, the general public could be interacting with a nonstop system multiple times and and not realize. Wow, my goodness. Okay. So do you expect to see more nonstop computing being used as AI workloads increased? 
I think that we have to try to do what we can to help our customers embrace AI. You know, obviously, as uh, as a company, that's what we're trying to do is make AI accessible and available to enterprises, no matter the size. I think that nonstop plays a part in that. But as I said, you know, we have we have specific business groups within HPE that are focused on how do we optimize uh, for AI workloads, and that's not what nonstop is known for and the value that we bring. But we absolutely need to make sure that we are, as I say, not AI adjacent and making sure that we're bringing the AI to nonstop rather than running AI on it. Because as you said, like AI is powered by data and fundamentally you're processing data. Exactly. Yeah. And and we are housing some of, you know, our customers' most critical data. And, you know, built into a nonstop platform is our SQL database. And so that's the fault tolerant database that we offer as part of that full software stack. And of course, yeah, it is where some of our customers' most mission critical data resides. Well, all I can say to that is that I wish that my internet provider was fault tolerant. (laughs) (laughs) But that's actually really interesting and, and kind of cool to understand not only the outputs of why that's so critical, but also the thinking and the architecture as well of how that works and how it's like a backup to a backup. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I thought, you know, the fact that in any given day, it's very likely that you'll be interacting with a nonstop system if you're buying anything on the internet or interacting with your bank, which I think is, uh, yeah, that's a real testament to just how trusted they are. What I thought was, was also interesting was when I asked Casey about why isn't every workload running on a completely fault tolerant system? And actually, I think she gave, the, she gave the correct answer, which I think it boils down to like, use the right tool for the right job like there's no need in some systems to have it completely fault tolerant and actually just high high availability is all that you need and actually i think that is so reflective of everything in our industry in you know in the way that we approach problems is like actually use the right tool for the right job well said finally like many of the people that we have on this podcast casey didn't always want to work in tech any thoughts about what you think casey might have wanted to be before she did what she is doing now My first guest is like medical field, like somebody important in the medical field, I feel like. Well, I'm not going to give it away. I'll let Casey say. I wanted to be a pediatrician. Oh, wow. Yeah, I did. I I wanted to be a doctor for children. And I actually started out my university career on that path. And uh, within about six months, I decided I wanted to switch to business because the reality of uh, dissecting things and uh, being in a a lab uh, doing biology kind of hit home. Uh, But yeah, that was my dream as a child. That's a great answer. Casey, thank you so much for joining us on Technology Now. Really appreciate your time. Okay, well, that brings us to the end of Technology Now for this week. Thank you to our guest, Casey Taylor. And of course, to our listeners, thank you so much for joining us. And as always, all of our sources are linked in the show notes. So make sure to check them out if you want to delve deeper into nonstop computing, which is fascinating. And if you've enjoyed this episode, please do let us know. You can rate and review us wherever you listen to episodes. And if you want to get in contact with us, send us an email to technologynow at hpe.com. And don't forget to subscribe so you can listen first every week. Technology Now is hosted by Aubrey Lovell and myself, Michael Bird. And this episode was produced by Harry Lampert and Izzy Clark. With production support from Alicia Kempson-Taylor, Becky Bird, Alison Gato, Alyssa Mitri and Renee Edwards. Our social editorial team is Rebecca Wissinger, Judy Ann Goldman and Jacqueline Green. And our social media designers are Alejandra Garcia and Ambar Maldonado. Technology Now is a fresh air production for Hewlett-Packard Enterprise. And we'll see you at the same time, the same place next week. Cheers. Cheers.